Hello and welcome to another video from Stanley Gins here at 399 Strand. Uh, today's video is just uh, to take people through, uh, to take you guys through the um, production of stamp. Uh, the traditional way of doing it um, from the early days of philately. Um, and most of these core elements uh, continued right on into the 1950s. Um, so it changed slightly over time, um, but the, the base ingredients in each stage of the process um, say pretty much the same um, for over a hundred years, um, obviously with some, some refinements as they went on. Um, so the first step in any stamp process, um, obviously in the days before Photoshop etc, uh, was literally a painting. Uh, these are known as artist essays, uh, these preliminary designs. Um, so they were produced by uh, Delarue artists usually, uh, in terms of the ones that survived. They are stamp sized um, extraordinarily finely detailed. Um, you'd almost have to use a single hair paintbrush for some of these designs. Uh, that's a GB one, and that's for, I believe, the Jubilee. Yeah, it is Jubilee, and that's an unadopted design. Um, we've got some Commonwealth ones here as well. Uh, we've actually got a Salon Telegraph cell coming up in the autumn, um, which contains these absolutely spectacular Telegraph essays, uh, also produced by Delarue. Um, now the comedy thing about these is that Delarue went to all this time and all this expense um, produced this whole series of exquisite essays, very very finely detailed. Um, you can see they proposed you know, different value tablets, uh, they got the monarch right, um, you know, you think of all the time that went into these. Uh, and the Colombo stamp office at the time just said, ah no, no thanks, too expensive, we'll do our own thing. So these are actually never issued. Um, which I think, you know, the more you look at these designs, you see it's an absolute tragedy. Um, so yeah, unadopted designs are a particular philatelic interest, especially when they tell the story. Um, so you, these are usually found in the greatest of exhibition collections, um, and they're usually found with incredible provenance as well. Um, the great thing about this salon stuff is it's never been on the market before. Um, it came straight out of the Delaware Archive, was sold private treaty uh, back in the 60s or 70s. Um, so this is the first opportunity that anyone's ever had to, to purchase this material before. Um, so uh, keep an eye on our auctions for autumn to have a chance to own some of these um, magnificent essays. Um, next in the process is the essays would, the stamp size essays would go to an engraver. Um, now the engraver would, uh, as it says, quite literally engrave a metal die um, by hand. Um, this is in the days before you know machine work, so it was all done by hand, extremely finely skilled. And from that uh, artist essay, you get what's called a die proof, the proof of a single metal die. So there's a GB one again. Um, now you can see this one is usually found the Delarue ones on glazed card. Um, they're usually dated as well, with the uh, date at the top left. Now you get before and after hardening. Um, which is a print uh, part of the uh, making up of the die. So after hardening was when the metal was firmed up, um, as, as you might say, and you get after striking as well. So there's all these different uh, technical print terms, um, and you can, as a collector, build up a series of these which tell uh, the dates and the timing of the print process. Um, you also get these, uh, a lot of plates interlocked, so the same design was used um, for uh, different values. So sometimes uh, the values were printed in two operations. So this is in cases where they would use the same core design, which you see here, but there'd be different values for each. So sometimes the plates interlocked, sometimes they were printed in two operations, but it saved the engraver having to re-engrave two uh, portraits, two frames, two country names uh, for every time. So you get them uh, undenominated, they're known as, and you get them denominated further along the line. So there was all sorts of ways for Delarue to do that, um, but there's also all sorts of different types of, uh, um, of die proofs you get along the way. Um, and often you get as well with die proofs, the, uh, the initials um, from, from the Delarue factory floor. Um, often it's the Postmaster General um, basically approving these or the head of Delarue. Um, you often get these approved at each step of the process. Um, now, after the die proofs, you get what are called striking book pieces. Um, and this again is from the Jubilee set. Um, you see these are different aspects of the design. So uh, different parts of uh, the plate um, or different plates combined to get the complete design. So this is often you get with bicolor stamps. Um, you get them engraved in two operations and you can get die proofs for each. Now, all the card and annotations you see here 
these are from the Delu Striking Book uh, or the Day Book um, or the Working Book. So there's 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 a few different there's a few different names for a few different um, uh, books which survived Delu depending on the the source of the material. But these are actually almost the factory floor um, prints that were used by the printers. Um, so you see in red there for Commonwealth, usually the red line is the invoice date. Um, you get uh, you normally get how many how many leads? It says leads. Leads meant a single die, um, and it says it said thirty leads. That would mean that you need thirty examples of this die, which would be made up into a plate. Um, so at this stage, when we're on the striking book pieces, we're usually still on single dies. So an engraving of one stamp being firmed up for production. Um, and you get often the printer's notes as well as a sort of operational, so you, I'll hold that one that way so you can see. So you get all Delarue's notes about, uh, often these are things like when there were subsequent printings or how many were required or colours, you can get all sorts of historical information, um, which from an exhibiting perspective is very, very important to telling the story of any issue. Um, so after the striking book pieces were made, you then get to the stage where you're uh, doing colour trials. Um, now, colour trials are very important, so you know what the stamp had looked like at this point. The design of stamp was um, approved, uh, the engraver's done his work with a single die, and at this point you would send off to the relevant authorities, um, so you, you know, it would be the Colombo Stamp Office in Salon, um, often it was the Postmaster General, or you know, the Monarch in many cases. Um, it all depends on the country and how their system ran, but they would be sent off um, for approval, and you'd send a selection off, so you'd say, we can print this, um, many of you GB collectors will recognise this stamp. This was issued as the Penny Lilac, um, but this trial um, is produced in a blue shade. Um, so the printers would essentially send almost a menu of colours off to the postal authorities um, who would say, we would like that stamp to be printed in this colour. Uh, so in this case they chose Lilac, um, but often you see like this one, this sort of chalky blue shade. Um, often the colour trials you see, you know, subjective, but you see much nicer ones than actually the issued colours. Um, from correspondence, you know, there's often all sorts of bureaucracy and regulations involved in why stamps ended up, you know, in certain colours. But I often think that the printers would have been quite disappointed that their chosen colours um, weren't, always, uh, weren't always selected. Uh, here's another one. So, as you see, another colour trial. A very iconic GB stamp here. Um, but in a different colour. Um, so we've got a colour trial here in a sort of lilac shade, um, obviously issued in a completely different colour. Um, the other aspect of these, uh, which I haven't got here, is uh, for Commonwealth uh, in particular, uh, the same, de same design, the same die would be used for multiple values in a set. So you'd have, um, you'd have a die, a single design used for a top value, so it would be used for 1, 2, 3, 5, 10 rupees. Um, for example, in the top values of the set. Uh, now, they would send off uh, 10 colour trials, uh, usually in perforate, on what they called an appendix sheet, um, with a, and they, each trial would be annotated with the proposed face value. So they'd say, well, this blue trial we think would be one, uh, this green trial would be two, for instance, um, and then you'd get all the initials um, all the way along the process approving these. Um, these are obviously very, very valuable because they're unique, um, and so they often sell very, very quickly when we have them in stock, which is why we haven't got any here today. Now, after the colour trials are chosen, you move one step along in the process um, and you get to uh, what's called plate proofs or imprimatas. Now, when we're talking GB, uh, the imprimatas um, are the, literally the first, uh, the first example of a complete plate printing. So they would make, uh, duplicate the die into the right sheet size, so however many are on the sheet. Uh, they'd have all the plate numbers and marginal annotations, and then they'd print off a complete imperforate sheet just to check. Um, they check every position, check that the dies uh, and the lettering have done, been done correctly, um, and someone would go through with a fine tooth comb to say, yes, this is all, this is all fine, um, there's no damage here. Um, so you get them imperforate. Uh, the other thing to note about um, plate proofs, and they, this is the most commonly um, commonly uh, mistaken question when it's different between plate proofs and die proofs. Die proofs, because it's only one impression, often have very, very large margins, um, or they're on a complete card. Uh, plate proofs, um, especially when they're non-marginal, have very, very small margins, because obviously the space between the stamps is only designed to fit perforations in, and that's it. 
Um, so if you've got imperfect proofs and they're very, very close together, they're usually plate proofs or imprimatis, whereas a single proof with large margins on all, si on all sides is usually a die proof. Um, so that's, that's the big difference between them. Uh, we've got another imprimatur here from GB. Um, you see the plate number there in the top. So this, this, this were very late in the process here. So the colour's been approved, the design's been approved, um, it's all been engraved, um, everything's basically ready apart from the perforations. Um, this is sort of the last check in the process. Um, and there's another one there. So you can see the plate number on the penny red as well in the corner. Um, so there's only one sheet of these for GB. Um, there's usually only one sheet for Commonwealth, but it depends on the issue and the period. Um, and uh, there's a number of other, it depends on the printer as well. Um, you know, Waterloo had very different processes to Delarue and Bradbury, for instance. So um, it's not quite as clear cut for, uh, for Commonwealth. Um, but they're still very, very interesting and very, very valuable. Um, and then after, after we've been plate proofs, they would simply add the perforations. And then you get to spectacular final designs. So here we go, on an iconic rarity of GB, the five pound orange. Um, so really here, the only difference um, from a plate proof is that the perforations have been added um, and that it's basically the finished stamp and it's ready, it's all ready to go out. Um, so you see here where it was imperfect before, you've got all the perforations added and that is the final design. Um, so that we've, uh, we've done a little book club on this process so that people um, people can understand it and see some examples we've had in stock. We call it from paintbrush to postman. Um, so the absolute genesis of a stamp design with a paintbrush, um, and a core concept to the final to the final issue going out. Um, so it's worth picking up next time you're in 399 Strand. It's a full guide um, to how classic stamp production worked. Uh, it focuses particularly on Victorian times. Um, but as I say, this process was largely unchanged in its core right almost up to the 1950s and 60s. Um, so there's a lot more goes into stamp design and uh, the production of it than you possibly have thought about before. Um, but they, they, it's lucky for us because some of these archives have produced some absolutely spectacular material um, which graces all the best collections uh, that we see and we handle and, and some of our best items in stock. Um, so it's, uh, we're lucky as philatelists that uh, so much of this material survived, particularly from the early days. Thank you for watching Stanley Gibbons on YouTube. Uh, for more engaging philatelic content, uh, please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel.